Hi guys, welcome to Sandy on Crafts. Today we are unboxing a Kerutaki Gansai Tambi box of 36 colors and then we will be swatching them to see how good they are. And if you stick with me till the end, I will also show you how I organize my swatches to make sure they are always on hand when I need them. Let's do this, shall we? Now I bought these on Amazon while they were having a sale and it ended up costing me less than 40 euros. I think it was like 36, 38 euros, so that would be around 40 dollars, I think. You can also find different sized sets, you know, both bigger and smaller, but I found this to be a great array of colors for a beginner who hasn't really tried mixing colors all that much yet. Now as a disclaimer, I have to say that this set is the only one I currently use. I love the colors and I'm a big fan and I think that will show throughout the video. But I will also let you know some of my struggles with it, you know, to try and be impartial and all that. So yeah, the unboxing happened a couple of months ago uh, and at the time I wasn't even sure if I would ever do a watercolor video for you guys, but the rest of it is done right now. Now, most of the information here is in Japanese, but you can still know the names and numbers for each color even before you remove the plastic that comes with the box. Also, the lid for this box is gorgeous. <laughs> it feels like old Japanese fabric, you know, it has a roughness to it and that beautiful, beautiful green. All Kerutaki Gan Saitambi sets come with the same lid and it is very much part of its charm. Immediately, you feel like you're holding something really special. And here you go, these are our lovely colors. And don't worry about how dark they look, okay? They will look completely different once you start painting with them. This set also comes with three metallic colors, you know, these three down here, and I'll be telling you all their names when I'm doing my swatches. Now, unlike the 48 set, you can see the info for each pen without having to remove it from the box, which I think is very practical. Now, the first impression you get when you receive this set is just how big these pens are. I mean, these are huge, so much bigger than your usual watercolor pens, right? They aren't filled to the brim though, some actually look quite shallow, but you can still see you will have plenty of watercolor paint to enjoy. Now as you can see, some look more grainy than others, some have tiny bubbles, I don't really know why, I imagine it's just the way they are made or the way they're poured into the pans, but you cannot tell the difference once you're painting with them. Now unfortunately, there is no light fastness rating or pigment information on the set, but I am told that's the case with all Gansai paints and it's just part of the tradition. But some other YouTubers have tested out the light fastness and they say it's pretty good. Now inside the lid there's a color chart for you to fill, but keep in mind that the paper on the lid isn't the same as the one you'll be using for your projects. So always swatch any palette on your own paper just to know exactly what to expect. Okay, here's our color chart all filled in months later. And although Karutaki himself tells us that these paints are kind of like between watercolor and gouache due to the binding they use in them, I can tell you right now that if you use the right amount of water, you can totally make them transparent. It is not hard at all. And I'm going to show you just how to do that with our swatches. Okay, so we start with our red. On one end, we will use very little water, just like so, so we can show the intensity of the pigment in its full glory. And then, we will start adding water. The idea here is making that gradient from full color to transparent. You know, and because Gansai paints are meant for rice paper, you will find it a bit harder to use the wet on wet technique when compared to other watercolors because they aren't meant to flow as easily. So for blooms and that cauliflower effect, you just know that it won't be as expressive. But on the other hand, it makes these paints easier to use on other types of paper, you know, other than watercolor paper. But again, with the right amount of water, it will be perfect. And I actually painted a hydrangea using the wet on wet method a couple of days ago and it turned out perfectly. So I will just post that video at the end of this video so you can watch it after this one and check out for yourself. Okay, so next we have Carmine. And again, we start with really strong paint here. And then we clean our brush. And then we add 
water from top to bottom. Ah, oh, there you go. So this is our carmine. It's gorgeous. It's one of my favorites. Okay, rose matter. Rose matter comes next. Here we go. Beautiful, strong colors, and we just go up like this and it starts pulling down and as you can see the pigment is really easy to activate for most colors all it takes is a drop of water and a couple of seconds but you know again as a beginner in the very beginning I kept having to remind myself of how little pigment I needed to use you know in order to paint with them I kept using too much paint and really struggled to achieve you know these softer colors we have down here you know, in fact, if I'm honest, it is still the biggest struggle I have with watercolors. You know, the subtlety, the lightness of touch. Okay, now we go to cadmium red. And we start down and we go up. And there you have it. Just like that. I don't usually go for very transparent, so this one is very good to for me and when it dries it will look something like that and that is beautiful okay sorry so I'm not sure if I made a mistake this is rose matter this is rose matter deep and now we're going for cadmium red sorry about that okay yeah this is indeed a red the other one more like pinks here we go oh I love this moment <laughs> it's my favorite when it just starts Pulling down Scarlet. You just start from down and there you go. And now we have cadmium orange. A lot of cadmiums over here. Cadmium orange. Ah, beautiful. Okay, so why are we doing this? <laughs> why isn't the lid chart enough? Because within one color is, as I usually say, and as you can see, loads of other colors. For example, how do you make gray? In acrylic or gouache, you just join black and white, right? In watercolor, you add water. Yellow ochre now. Ooh, yeah. We will be spreading it around like so come out yeah and next we have cadmium yellow so so bright and then we go down and here it comes next comes aurelin aurelin aurel okay aurelin Okay, another bright, bright yellow. This one here. We don't want them to meet. And then we have lemon yellow, which I personally love. This is our lemon yellow, and it's almost fluorescent. <laughs> okay, here we go. Calm down, my pretty. Calm down. You know, this is Canson paper, and Canson paper is a great beginner paper, for sure, but it does tend to pull a little, and I guess that's what we're seeing here right now. And since I didn't really, yeah, you can just dab it like that. Because since I didn't strap this paper down, it's buckling, and since it's buckling, you know, the paint is going down, and we don't want it to go down, we want it to go up, if anything. Because, you know, down here, it's supposed to be the very, very light. Yeah, that's much more like it. Okay. Okay, now we go into my favorite color, which is olive green. Well, if not my favorite color, my favorite green for sure. Also, <laughs> this is a bit of a trivia. Uh, my last name is what I could translate into olive tree. So anything olive is right down my alley. Well, olives particularly. Oh, I love it. <laughs> okay, a few more greens next. So sap green light first. That's this one. And it's this one over here. That's, oh, this is really big one too. Okay. Mm, 
Yeah. Then we have sap green, which is this one. There we go. Okay, followed by hooker's green. Hooker's green. There we go. Oh, this is beautiful. And if you feel like the upper color isn't strong enough, that's okay. Just continue on, just spreading it, and then you go back and you just reinforce it like that. Good. And now we have set green deep, which is this one. Ooh, I like this one. It has a mossy feeling, mossy feeling to it. I like it. You know, I like greens and blues and pinks. I think those are my favorite colors to use. You probably recognize some of these names from your own watercolor palettes, but some of the colors may actually surprise you. And the reason why most of these names are common to most watercolor palettes is because they come from pigment used to make these colors. It's actually quite an interesting thing to research. You know, you get to learn so much about the origin of pigments and how some of the natural ones are now practically extinct, which I was totally shocked to learn. Okay, next is Viridian. Next, forest green. And can you see how dark this one is here? <laughs> it won't be dark for long, I can tell you that. But look at that. Beautiful, beautiful green. Calm down. Yeah, that's right. What's next? Turquoise. Okay. Turquoise. 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 Turquoise green deep. Also, kind of looks like black. Well, this is more of a blue. I think we're transitioning into blues, maybe. <laughs> it is deep, that's for sure. Here we go. Come on down. Oh, gorgeous. Turquoise, turquoise. Okay. This is supposed to be our last green of the bunch. To me, it's kind of a blue already. <laughs> and I just find swatch making so incredibly relaxing. It is like a small meditation while you get to put brush to paper without a care in the world. It's not a drawing or anything and you just need to swatch and enjoy the whole process. So next we have Malachite. Malachite? I hope that's how it's said. I'm not sure, sorry. I, have, I hope I'm not butchering these names or anything. Let's just come on down, my pretty. And ultramarine pale. And this one is the perfect sky blue, in my opinion. I use it all the time as such. And again, really strong. Then we come from down here and we just spread it down like so. This palette has a lot of greens, but some beautiful blues as well. And I have read that the Gansai colors are meant to feature all the colors in nature in Japan. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, next up we have Ultramarine and Cerulean Blue. So this is Ultramarine. Oh, gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous. And last for this page is turquoise, turquoise, oh god, turquoise blue. <laughs> also one of my favorites. Let me show you. Beautiful. You know, I think it's inevitable to have favorite colors in palettes. I am yet to meet someone who uses all the colors in a palette. You know, there's always a couple of favorites that you end up using so much more than others. So Prussian blue comes next. Again, very dark. Yeah, pretty though. You just come from... Next, indigo. 
again one of my favorite colors and just look at how dark this looks <laughs> looks like black but it's not it is a beautiful beautiful blue Prussian is very deep but indigo you know has a bit of a gray tone that kind of fades as you make it more and more transparent and oh, look at that I just love this and you see what I've told you in the beginning how one color can have all these different tones depending on the amount of water and we're not even mixing them so when you see these big palettes filled with different options remember you do not need all that you can make all the colors you need right here Okay, so now we go to violets. And this is our imperial violet, right? Ooh, look at that. My favorite moment, here we go. Okay, so imperial violet, and now it is time for cobalt violet. Mmm, pretty. So, so pretty. And some purple, which is actually, you know, kind of pink. <laughs> this isn't what I would think about when I imagine purple at all, right? But here it is. Guys, we are almost done. Next comes Burnt Sienna, which is this little guy over here. And of course, Raw Umber Deep, which is this one right here. And now we have the black, which I really, 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 really want to be careful about because I totally want to turn this into gray. I want you to see all the gray shades we can have with this one. So I'm going to be real careful about it. Yeah, just like that. Then I'm going to go back just reinforce the now all there's left is our white which we will also be swatching because you know why not <laughs> but i don't expect many gradients here you know if any ah oh, there you go white and metallic colors are kind of hard to activate so i just gotta work it there we go this lovely beauty it's kind of pearly really I don't know if you can see the shimmer. I'm not really sure how I can show you the shimmer, to be honest, but it is definitely there. I'll show you once it's dry, I guess. Now, as you can see, our metallics are A, hard to activate, B, not really shiny on white paper. On black paper, though, oh, they are absolutely gorgeous, just beautiful. You know, it's a completely different story. And if you like metallic watercolors and would like me to make a video with all my metallic collection on black paper, just let me know in the comments and I'll make that video for you, no problem. <laughs> okay, here's our last one. Gold, ooh. This one's pretty. Okay, going up, 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 up. And there you have it, our Kerutake Gun Saitambi swatches that I will be using over and over and over again. Let's get these to dry a little bit so we can keep going, okay? But how do I use it? How do I make it so I can check my colors instantaneously, the moment I need them? Even when the time comes that I have several watercolor palettes, and that they will come, I'm pretty sure, and I have all sorts of swatches from all sorts of sets, and I just need to compare them. Well, we do it the way house painters do it. Let me show you. Okay, we are back, and now, here are our tiny little swatches, cute as a button, all dried. Look at all those different degrees of color. I love this. Look at this. Indigo is just precious. Purple, etc., etc. And as you can see, I have cut them all into sequence. Okay, the same, the exact same sequence we did when swatching them out. Now we are just going to keep them all together in this ring right here. And as you can see, this is a previous swatch, it was my first set. <laughs> no gradients, no variations of color. As you can see, I was pretty much a beginner and had no idea what I was doing, but that's beside the point. I don't use this set anymore. So we are going to add these swatches to this ring right here. And I always keep this ring with me or, you know, close to me when I'm painting, so that way just like painters do, you know, people who paint houses do, 
you have all the swatches of color right here. So you can browse through them, compare to similar colors, you know, from different palettes, whatever you need. Now, another very handy little trick is making sure all palettes have different size swatches. You know, that way you know exactly which palette they belong to. We just need to do a little hole and I suggest you do a hole on this corner right here so that the name and the number are very visible when you want to browse through them. So just give me a second and I will be right back. Can you see the shimmer in this one? Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Here's the white. You can see a little bit. <laughs> And final ones here. Okay, now we just pick all of these up. Oh, my hands hurting from all this punching. All of these up. We open this one and we just start to put them all here. Just like so. I think I'm getting all of them. Yeah, and that's it. Here are our swatches. Beautiful, practical, all the information you need right here in your hand. And that's pretty much it. Our palette is unboxed, swatched, and ready to be used. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.